Another eerie dream struck Vanessa, this time seeing her falling from a cable car. She descended in terror, expecting to pass away soon, the cabin wobbly and a shattered mount looming behind her. The nightmare ended, as it always does, right before impact, leaving Vanessa to wake up covered in a sticky sweat and feeling terrified in her throat. She questioned whether she would experience these nightmares for the rest of her life. Two months previously, on the third day following her parents' funeral, she had her first nightmare. It felt like she had already experienced the worst at that point. Soon after the funeral, her family received a call from the mountaineering camp, where they had gone to realize their mountain vacation fantasy. Vanessa wondered why she had grown up seeing her parents, who thought it better to take their daughter on a seaside holiday, always delaying the much-anticipated trip. They finally packed their bags and left for a mountain resort that brought back memories of their college years when Vanessa reached a certain age. Regretfully, they chose to take in the long-awaited beauty from above right as the cable car broke down. Vanessa thought back to the sage advice she had received from Granny Sophia next door, who had consoled her during the funeral by telling her not to cry and that God takes the soul at its purest time. Granny Sophia thought it best that Vanessa's parents, who had just a few decades left together in this world but were destined for eternity in the next, depart together with happiness in their hearts. Vanessa prayed for her parents, but the nightmare continued, precisely, over and over. Vanessa knew she needed to get up and start getting ready for college as the sun was coming up outside her window. She realized that resting in bed would not make things better, on the contrary, it would make things worse. The worn-out wooden floor gave a part under her feet, a sign that renovations were not likely to happen anytime soon, her parents had planned to begin them. Vanessa found herself in a predicament where she had to spend the money left over from their vacation to pay for education and survive. She could think about taking a part-time job, but there was always the doubt about whether she would have enough energy. Vanessa considered going to a correspondence department, but she was hesitant because of her worries about the poor quality of instruction in those kinds of programs. She stood up, eyes heavy with fatigue, glanced out the window, and determined it was time to speak with the chancellor of the college. Vanessa suddenly became a grown-up, and she spent the next few weeks adjusting to the correspondence department, handling homework, and looking for a suitable employment. While everyone made an effort to help the distraught girl, moving to the communication department wasn't too difficult. But finding a job proved difficult because businesses would not hire her without a degree and experience, or the jobs that were available didn't fit a young, inexperienced person. Vanessa had misjudged the challenges she would encounter. She first thought that young, motivated people might obtain excellent careers without much difficulty, but she soon came to terms with the hard truth. One bad day, following a botched interview for a job as an office secretary, she just walked down the street without thinking about going back home, even though the old house made her miss her parents terribly. One restaurant display caught her eye, it showed a small doll man with a turban, sitting cross-legged and shaking his head like he was in a fairy tale. Vanessa remained a little childlike as she stood motionless, staring at the elaborate doll that took her mind off of her depressing thoughts for a time. The doll gave a self-assured nod, hiding a small smile behind his mustache, as though to comfort her that all good things eventually come to an end, even her sorrow. Vanessa felt herself settling down and taking a moment to reflect before heading back. But then her eyes fell to the porch steps and landed on a leather pocketbook. After a moment of hesitation since she had heard of thieves taking advantage of such circumstances to rob innocent bystanders, Vanessa allowed a feeling of duty to take over. She snatched up the wallet and pushed in the restaurant door, determined to help its owner. Vanessa said, good afternoon. I found this on the porch. Maybe the owner will come back for his loss. The young man was taken aback and opened the wallet to find a large sum of cash, a bank card, and several business cards. Vanessa was standing behind the bar. Grinning, he told Vanessa that the wallet belonged to the restaurant owner whose office was upstairs and she could give it back to him. The restaurant owner was an old man with brown hair and graying temples. When he saw his wallet, he seemed surprised and puzzled. Appreciating Vanessa's candor, 
he proposed that she let him know if she needed anything. Vanessa, who had been in need of parental support, broke down in tears and told this nice stranger her heartbreaking experience because of his sympathetic tone. With a gentle smile and the air of someone who had seen a lot in life, the restaurant owner thought Vanessa had come to him by chance. He immediately made her an offer of a job with a respectable wage after learning about her recent troubles and the passing away of her parents. Although there was now just one dishwasher position open, he gave Vanessa the reassurance that opportunities for other positions might arise in the future. Declaring that he would protect her, he urged Vanessa to approach him if someone had wronged her, and he closed by saying, accept it. Vanessa wiped away her tears and nodded joyfully, considering it a tempting proposition at first. She identified herself as Roberto, the establishment's owner, and reassured Vanessa about the excellent staff at the eatery. Roberto thought Vanessa would enjoy working there because they had a zero-tolerance policy for unpleasant people and acknowledged that clients were different. He told her that although it might not be the most prestigious position, it was a good start and asked her to come back at 8 o'clock the next day. Vanessa grinned and nodded, used to cooking because she frequently had company over. Her loose hair was disheveled by the warm wind as she strolled along the promenade in the evening. Vanessa discovered more than a year later that Roberto, who had increased her pay in addition to being honest about his team, was still her employer. She decided to stay at the restaurant even after graduating from college because she liked the warm, dependable, and caring environment. Vanessa, appreciative of the help, made the decision to stay put, especially since Roberto's raise enabled her to begin remodeling her former home. But a strange noise came from the left side, interrupting the calm stream of thought. It was hard to tell who was creating the squeaky sound in the waning twilight. Vanessa looked closer and saw that it came from a bundle in a young woman's arms two meters distant. Vanessa was alarmed by the woman's pose of strain and misery as she stared intently into the black water beneath the bridge. Vanessa felt something wasn't right, but she was hesitant to move for fear of offending the stranger. After a while, the woman looked up from the water and saw Vanessa. Her eyes reflected the emptiness of someone who had experienced great pain, sobbing and yelling, and finally giving up. It was too late, but Vanessa had a strong need to yell, to beg the young woman not to give up. Seemingly aware of the danger, the infant in the woman's arms went from a feeble squeak to a desperation howl. The young mother retreated from the bridge railing in response to the scenario, and Vanessa finally overcame her first horror to grab her by the shoulders. How can you do this? You're so young, and you have a baby, Vanessa said, sounding both bewildered and desperate. What the hell are you doing, she asked. She was speechless, unable to think of anything to say in such a painful circumstance. The young mother, her eyes welling with sorrow, opened up about her troubles, describing how she had no money, nowhere to live, nothing to feed her baby, and her milk gone. She believed there was no purpose in life. The woman started to cry, and Vanessa's heart began to melt. Vanessa saw her emotional reaction and realized she had to move quickly. She suddenly realized that she had an envelope in her purse that held the incentives and salary that Roberto had given her that day. She wasn't expecting the bonus that Roberto had given her for the occasion of her graduation. The young woman, still astonished, wrapped the baby in her old sweatshirt. Vanessa grabbed her arm and said, we're going to the supermarket now. There, we'll buy some food for you and the baby. Don't try to refuse. They didn't hesitate, to go to the closest grocery store. The infant was silent, as if it was looking forward to dinner. Vanessa's bonus barely covered the cost of necessities, fruit and vegetable purees, a bottle, a pacifier, infant formula, diapers, and some nourishment for the tired mother. Realizing that she would have to make formula and that it would be too chilly to change the baby outside, Vanessa made the decision to take Rebecca, the young mother, inside her home. Chatting away, the two women were feeding six-month-old Alex and preparing dinner together. Rebecca related her insignificant but heartbreaking tale of a lovely romance that was cut short by an unplanned pregnancy. All the emotions subsided, and promises of unending love vanished. 
The story's conclusion showed that the baby's father had paid the rent a year ahead of time and vanished from sight three months after Alex was born. Rebecca's parents had taken over her elder brother's house, so when the rent was up, they were going to have to move out of the room in her hometown. There was nothing to be found by wandering the city, and the narrative may have ended tragically if Vanessa hadn't performed an unexpected miracle. Vanessa found it incomprehensible that the father would tolerate such deceit, abandoning a pregnant woman to live in poverty. Furious, Vanessa, still a child but dealing with adult issues, asked how he managed to get any sleep at all. With a somber reply, Rebecca rocked Alex, who had just finished a substantial meal, until he fell asleep. Vanessa struggled with the serious predicament and looked for a way out throughout a restless night. She was at a loss for what to do, and it dawned on her that Alex's mother was homeless, and that he might wind up in an orphanage. Vanessa gave Rebecca the keys and told her to stay at her house for the time being before heading off for work in the morning. Vanessa's thoughts turned to Roberto as she was walking to the restaurant. She wondered how much he missed his daughter and how much he shielded her. She was unaware of Roberto's family background, but there were whispers that he disapproved of his daughter's fiancé. She allegedly disconnected her phone, left no address, and fled her parents' home with her sweetheart. Rumor has it that Roberto was so incensed at first that he didn't even try to locate his daughter since he thought she had betrayed the family's honor. Roberto's daughter vanished, and the years went by with no word. Roberto overcame his conceit and began aggressively searching for her. Still, the search turned up empty. Vanessa wondered if his daughter was the same as Rebecca, homeless and without family. Vanessa carried the thought with her throughout her day. The working hours passed by swiftly, and Vanessa rushed back to the supermarket in the evening to greet her surprise visitor. After unpacking the suitcases, Rebecca just went to the bathroom to wash her hands and discreetly set the table. She rubbed her hands, said something catchy, and then started eating enthusiastically as everyone was seated. Vanessa was curious about the proverb and Rebecca told her that her late friend used to say it each time she had dinner. Rebecca spoke it now, recalling it. Another restless night for Vanessa, this one centered on the math involved in food shopping. She realized that she was not going to be able to feed the three of them. Given Alex's stringent dietary needs, which included costly formula, dairy products, and some diet meat, Vanessa came to the conclusion that the child shouldn't have to bear the consequences of the adult troubles. She made the decision to seek Roberto for permission to take leftovers home from banquets because she was determined to find a solution. Vanessa considered the rules of the restaurant, any food left on the tables or on dishes that wasn't completely eaten had to be thrown out. But because there was an unspoken rule in the restaurant industry, any delicious and fresh leftovers might be taken home by the personnel rather than going to waste. Vanessa thought she was paid enough to get by without it, but she had previously been too hesitant to take advantage of this. But things had changed, and she realized she had to look for this other option. But now that things have changed, she has to take responsibility for both her own deeds and for adjusting to the harsh reality of the outside world. The Big Feast was scheduled for the following week, and Vanessa took a long time to approach Roberto. When she could take no more, she said, Roberto, I've never requested anything like this before, but given the circumstances, could I also take the leftovers from today's banquet? I truly need it. Roberto, raising his left eyebrow subtly, answered, certainly, you can take it. Did you get a pet? Vanessa looked embarrassed, answering, no, I don't have any pets yet, but I'm committed to helping people. Any food is valuable to someone in need. For some reason, Roberto went pale and tried not to show how nervous he was, asking, where did you hear that saying? Vanessa replied, I have a roommate who always repeats it before dinner. She has a baby, no job, no money, and nowhere to live, so I requested leftovers f. There, he reached into the refrigerator for a bottle of water, drained it fast, and thought frantically about where Vanessa's roommate may have picked up the proverb belonging to his late buddy Alexander. The saying from the battlefield was brought by Alexander, who passed away in the flames of the fallen chopper, and was exclusively used at home before supper. 
Roberto clenched his jaw, sprayed his face with the last of the water, and thought about his daughter. A persistent question tormented him, is Cora back? Is it really a coincidence, or might it be a woman who was formerly acquainted with Cora? Roberto felt a ray of hope for the first time in a long time, and he was determined not to let it fade. He moved around the office nervously. A whirlwind of contradictory feelings swept over him, including a chilly worry that this hope would be in vain, a burning impatience to find out the truth, and a timid delight of hope. His thoughts was filled with questions, what would he say to Cora if it wasn't her, and how would he respond to his daughter if it was? There was only one thing for sure, something had to be clarified, and there was no way to put it off until tomorrow. He couldn't go alone, in order to keep Cora from being spooked and possibly make things more complicated, Vanessa had to go. So Roberto had to sit through what seemed like an eternity before the dinner was over. Roberto was pained even though the restaurant had a busy and restless environment with happy patrons who were hesitant to leave. Normally, he would have been happy that the meal went well, but just now it was a painful ordeal. At last, at midnight, people started to go. Anxious to make sure Vanessa wouldn't go without him, Roberto went downstairs, got into his car, and waited the remaining hour until the exhausted staff left. He watched everyone leave the restaurant, and as he did so, an old ache came roaring back from the recesses of his memory. In light of his daughter's apparent inappropriate choice of fiancé, he wondered why he had been so harsh in the past. Maybe he could have found a solution instead of making snap decisions. If only his late wife Nina were still with us, she could have handled these kinds of situations and calmed her direct and feisty husband. Roberto was a different man now, broken and haunted by the recollections of a moment when Nina had soothed him with her kind manner, never losing her temper, never yelling, never saying anything unpleasant. If only Cora had been able to resemble Nina more. Roberto was so engrossed in his memories that he was unaware Vanessa had already left. He didn't realize it until her frail figure slowly vanished into the growing obscurity. The worried father turned on his car and followed Vanessa with caution, trying not to go too quickly. The eatery wasn't far from Dessa's home. After waiting for her to bring the suitcases inside the home, Roberto hesitated for a second before gathering his courage. Stepping out of the vehicle, he trailed her. Roberto felt something wasn't right as he resolutely opened the gate and entered the courtyard. Vanessa was sitting on the porch, her shoulders shaking slightly as she revealed that she was crying. She had thrown the bags on the ground. Vanessa, what happened? Are you all right? Why are you crying here on the porch, inquired a bewildered Roberto. Roberto spoke in a tense tone, but the upset girl didn't seem to notice him. The baby stuff was all over the floor, the keys were on the table, and she murmured, they're gone, both mother and baby, and they left in a hurry. Vanessa said, I have no idea what could have happened. Maybe they were afraid of someone. We can't figure anything out. Roberto pulled himself together and said, let's go inside and try to understand what's going on. But when they got inside the house, the two were still confused. There were a few hurriedly dropped baby garments, an open diaper pack, and a formula bottle all over the place. Roberto was about to bend over and pick up the fallen objects when he unexpectedly noticed a picture on the ground. He felt a betrayal of his legs, a stinging ache piercing his heart. The best picture on the bookshelf since the day Carol fled away was of a young Roberto holding Mina. It showed them on their wedding day. After all these years, there was no question about it being her. Still, the issue tormented him, where could he locate her now? What misdeeds brought about these disastrous conditions for him? Just when he thought he had found his daughter, she was gone again. His shaking, disobedient fingers scanned feverishly through the contacts list, looking for any indication that someone might have provided refuge for his daughter. He couldn't quite figure out why, but he figured she could be scared to take the baby back home. He would be ecstatic to have her back, no matter how many kids she had. But the truth was harsh, not many family friends remained, particularly after so many years. The businesslike voice of a woman unexpectedly cut off the frenzied quest. 
Vanessa received an apology from a neighbor who had come inside the house in the middle of the night. She asked why there was so much anguish and soothed them. Because of the baby's fever and vomiting, the physicians decided to transport them to the central hospital out of caution. The infant was unable to express any other possible problems. The visitor had gone to the neighbor because she didn't have a phone of her own, and the neighbor quickly called for help. Roberto skipped the rest of the conversation and ran to the car. Vanessa hastened after him, snatching the suitcases that had been left on the porch. As the automobile raced down the deserted nighttime highway, Roberto was gripped by a feverish exhilaration that would not go away. The long-awaited reunion felt surreal, and he wondered if it was really true. He was too tired to feel hopeful, he had waited too long. The emergency room nurse at the hospital gave up virtually without a struggle, unable to stop the determined parent who was about to accomplish his goal. Roberto ran up the stairs like a small boy as soon as he knew the floor and room number. Panting, Vanessa tried to keep up. At last he made it to the appropriate door, and amazingly his powerful hands avoided shattering the doorknob. Inside, his elderly adorable kid slept soundly in a crib while a woman lay on the bed and stared out the window. The woman turned to try to identify those who had arrived when a voice, full of grief and hope, broke through the quiet of the hospital. Roberto's legs began to shake violently, and he was forced to grip a neighboring chair as his breath caught. He gasped, you're not Coro, the words hanging heavy in the air. Where's Coro? Where's my girl? Roberto's voice was tense, but Rebecca calmly answered, yes, I'm not Coro. Coro was my best friend. You must be Robert Toole's father, then. Take a seat, it's a long story. We met five years ago, shortly after Carol and Eduardo ran away from home, she went on. Eduardo had his own apartment in our city, and I lived in the same building on the same floor. Coro and I instantly became friends. She was cheerful, life-loving, and daring, qualities I had always lacked. Next to her, these qualities emerged from nowhere. We could talk for hours, she understood me even without words, and I understood her too. Rebecca clarified, she would come to me when she and Eduardo argued. Eduardo couldn't adapt to adult family life. He earned money only to squander it at parties with his friends in just a couple of nights. He believed money should come and go easily. Carol would get angry, and he would fall on his knees, showering her with compliments. She couldn't resist the charms of the heartbreaker, and she forgave him instantly. However, she realized they couldn't sustain this lifestyle forever. Quarrels became more frequent, Rebecca said. Coro, with her tough nature, never gave up on her opinions. Eduardo would yell, go to his friends, and Coro would, come to me. She regretted running away from home, but her pride wouldn't let her return. She spoke often about you and her late mother, describing your strong and happy family. Then Eduardo hatched a plan. Unable to earn as much as he wasted, he claimed a business trip, packed his suitcase, and left. I didn't believe him, he often talked to a woman on the phone. From the fragments of conversations, it seemed she was wealthy. Apparently, he went to be with that woman. She was wealthy, and Eduardo was probably the only person in the world who could make life happy and exciting. Carl found out she was pregnant after they left, but she was unable to tell him since he would not answer calls or provide detailed information about his whereabouts. Even though Caro knew he had abandoned her, she decided to stay in the city in the hopes that he would come back, which, regrettably, never did. Eduardo is still not aware that he is a father. It's interesting that Caro named their child after several of your friends, saying that you were best friends, served in the army together, and experienced combat together. Caro finally made the decision to go back home after Alex was born, but things tragically changed. Our building caught fire, which was made worse by late wire replacements. The fire started in spite of the delay, and when I got back from work, I saw billowing black smoke coming from our windows. Hurrying upstairs, I discovered the apartment completely destroyed by flames, leaving no way to enter. 
carbon monoxide poisoning and severe burns claimed the lives of Koro and three others. But amazingly, little Alex was safe. Caro had apparently rolled the stroller onto the balcony with him when the fire started, along with a few extra items. She probably returned for more but never showed up again. Firefighters found Koro passing away at her apartment door, but they also found Alex on the balcony, still in his stroller. Among the things in the pram was your picture, which Caro treasured above anything else. Alex moved into another apartment for a while before the ambulance brought him to the hospital to be checked up. I tried to get access, but the custody officials wouldn't let me. Not having a husband, a steady job, or an apartment, I had trouble finding your address. It was a drawn-out process, and while in the orphanage, Alex's health declined, he began to lose weight, refuse food, and cry all the time. I tried to comfort him by taking him on a stroll one day and giving him hugs. He started weeping loudly out of the blue, and when I lifted up his sleeves, I saw bruises, which meant he had been punished for upsetting someone by crying. Driven by rage, I raced to the highway, stopped a truck, and the driver transported me to your city, not understanding the ramifications or my limited resources. I couldn't utilize social media or ask for help because I didn't know how to reach you and I was afraid the orphanage had reported the kidnapping to the authorities. My apartment burned down, my confidence crumbled, my wrath subsided, and I was left with nothing to eat and no money to walk the streets. I was very hopeless on the bridge when Vanessa came across me, the Lord had delivered me from sin. I was too scared to tell Vanessa the truth, which is how I ended up at her house. The rest is already known to you. There was a long, oppressive hush. It would have been better for Roberto, sitting there swaying with his hands clasped over his head, to have screamed and cried. Vanessa fought back tears as she trembled with tense stress. Desperately silent, Rebecca wondered how long they would sit this way. A famished Alex broke the silence with a cacophonous cry of his presence. Roberto eventually stood up, looking ten years older with streams of tears hidden under deep wrinkles, as Rebecca turned to face the infant. It shocked him, but he was a strong man. He waited for Alex to settle back in place. Rebecca, don't be afraid of anything. You gave me my grandson back, and now my house is your house. You can live there as long as you want. I'll take care of any legal problems, my connections are good enough. Come straight to my house from the hospital. I'll retrieve your belongings from Vanessa myself. Rebecca had no time to say anything since she was frightened she would lose control of her emotions. Roberto said to Vanessa, I'll wait in the car, and hurried out of the room. Vanessa gave Rebecca a wave before moving on to follow him. A girl, a young lady holding a baby, a man with short gray hair, and a dark-eyed girl with rebellious curls over her high forehead stood before the tomb. From the monument's glossy black top, she peered at them. Roberto remarked, well, at least we finally met, darling, and set a bunch of burgundy flowers on the couch. Forgive your stupid and arrogant father. I know you can hear me. She forgave you long ago. Roberto said, Coro never said anything bad about you, only good things. That's good, when Rebecca patted his elbow. People need to be forgiven, the sooner, the better. Unfortunately, I was too late to realize this simple thing. Roberto reassured Vanessa, I need to spend time with my grandson, so I won't be able to be at the restaurant as often as before. With these words, he took Alex in his arms, who immediately cuddled up to him, and they slowly wandered towards the exit from the cemetery, entering a new phase of such a complicated and sometimes completely unpredictable life. Vanessa asked fearfully, what are you afraid of? You're the administrator now, you need to get used to it. 